All right. Yes. Go. All right. Welcome, everyone. Uh, so this is the first flow seminar of uh, 2022. Um, so I am Aurelian. I'm one of the co-organizers of, uh, of this seminar, uh, along with Peter Richterick, Virginia Smith, Dan Alistar, and Samuel Orvat. Uh, so for those who would be first attend attendees, um, so the goal of this seminar is to provide a forum to discuss latest uh, results in all aspects of federated learning. So this includes uh, things related to distributed optimization, learning theory, privacy and security, like today's talk, uh, personalization, compression, systems, hardware, and of course, applications. And I guess this is not really exhaustive uh, either. Um, and so before I introduce maybe today's speaker, or today's speakers, actually, uh, just a quick explanation of how to ask questions uh, during the talks, so all the mics are off by default for uh, the audience, but you can use the raise hand feature uh, or write questions in the chat. And then uh, Samuel and I will, will handle the questions. So I think the, the speakers have a, uh, so some kind of a break at the middle of the, uh, their talk where it might be uh, nice to ask questions, but I guess you can also use the chat to ask the questions as, as they go, right? And we, we, will, we will then, uh, ask them, or you can ask them to yourself uh, when uh, when relevant. Okay, so that's it. And then uh, let me introduce uh, uh, the speakers uh, today. So, so today again is a bit special because we have some kind of double act. So, okay, so this is the first time like a talk by by two speakers. Uh, so Ahmed Adadi and Fan Mo. So thanks a lot for accepting the the invite. So Ahmed is a reader in human center systems at Imperial College London. Uh, and also he's a chief scientist at Adray, which is a company that develops a privacy preserving internet browser. And so he works there on developing privacy preserving analytics protocols. And broadly speaking, he's interested in user center system, uh, internet of things, applied machine learning and data security and privacy. Uh, Fan, he's a PhD student at Imperial College London, supervised by Hamed. He works on data privacy and trustworthiness in machine learning at the edge. And so he's been working uh, lately on kind of using trusted execution environments for fidelity learning. And so this is the, the topic of the, the, the talk today. Uh, so Hamed and uh, Fan will talk about how to do privacy preserving fidelity learning with trusted execu execution environments, TEEs. So essentially where the model updates are performed inside some secure hardware, both at the client and at the server. So if I'm not mistaken, this work obtained Best Paper Award at uh, Mobisys 2021. So this is the ACM International Conference on Mobile Systems, Applications and Services. And I think this is also the first talk we have at Flow about the use of TEEs in, in FL. So, so I think it's quite nice to, to, to cover this and I'm uh, really looking forward to, to the talk. Thanks very much. Thanks for the introduction. Um, uh, yes, uh, so this idea started uh, actually three years ago uh, when uh, Vincent uh, Fan, or Vincent uh, as, uh, as we refer to him, uh, started his, uh, his PhD. And the idea was that uh, as, as we are facing a number of challenges uh, in terms of uh, various attacks and uh, privacy leakages in federated learning, how can we uh, protect? Uh, how can we provide some sort of uh, initial uh, defenses against uh, various leakages? And uh, then it led to to a couple of papers, including one in Mobisys twenty, and then uh, one in Mobisys twenty one, which was which won the best paper, as you said. So, if uh, Vincent, you go to the next stage, uh, next slide. Um, also, I, I I thought it's worth mentioning that. Uh, Vincent has done all the heavy lifting of uh, this work and uh, it's kind of bringing him towards the end of his PhD. So he will be on the job market late, later this year if somebody is looking for a bargain. There we go. <laughs> so, so the problem that we are facing is that uh, there are two ways. One, uh, there are two issues. One of them is uh, all the initial attacks on federated learning, for example, the membership inference attacks or uh, property inference attack and things like that. And the other issue that we are increasingly facing in industry is how do we protect the models um, either on the server side or on the client side from, um, from tampering and inferences? A couple of, a couple of examples of uh, protecting models obviously is uh, when you get a face ID or touch ID on a bunch of devices. So we thought, okay, how can we use uh, secure enclaves, which at the moment they have very limited uh, um, uh, kind of uh, storage uh, kind of capacity in order to uh, to help us uh, with uh, with this uh, with this uh, uh, privacy 
And uh, so the first uh, stage of this process was uh, firstly, how much can we squeeze in uh, models and data into TEs in the first place if we are doing federated learning specifically? And uh, since Vincent has done all the heavy lifting, I'll let him uh, take over from this stage. Thank you very much for the introduction. So uh, let me go into the details of the work. So basically, at the beginning, I, I believe most of the audience know what is federated learning is. So just as a background here, I will introduce a little, a little bit. So federated learning is what if there is a cloud, right? There is a cloud. So the, at the server side, which is a cloud side, so the global model will be transferred Will be downloaded by the uh, by the device, and then after the training happened on the device, the local data will be aggregated in some way into the global model, and as a and then it becomes a local model, which is a model has been trained on the device, and then the model is updated to the cloud, and there is many device there and. After the aggregation, we have the global model again. So this is one cycle of this whole process in federated learning. So why would we want federated learning? Everybody know is that first we want privacy because in this case, we don't need to share uh, the client's local data, but the model. And another thing is about computation. In this way, we, tra uh, we transfer the computation from the cloud, uh, from the cloud to the client. So in such in such a way, we some we do some outsource of the computation. So, but the problem is, unfortunately, so there are some privacy issue still exist here. So there are many research, many works had explored this. So because the model and the gradient still memorize the data set in some way, so we can't believe that the Federated learning can pre prevent anything. So, for example, in this case, we want to mention more about the privacy related attacks. There are three attacks that I list here data reconstruction attack, property inference attack, membership inference attack. So, all of those attacks can exist. For example, this is a malicious users or adversary exist as a cloud or the client. So, basically, they can not. By based on uh, looking at the gradients or the model, they can infer some information such as um, the training data, the membership, uh, whether it is exists. For example, I know this guy, or is this data is a man, or maybe the original data in some way. So I will going to give you some more. Um, specific idea of what those attacks are. First of all, membership inference attack. So basically, when you have a model that has been trained based on some data set, one attacker can do some inference or some attack based on the model, which is a, maybe it's also a gradient because in fact, you're learning when you share the model, when you subtract two model, it, it, you get the gradients of the training. So you, when you when attacker input some, uh, some, uh, some data, maybe it's uh, original data, and it get uh, results, it can infer whether this original input is the membership of the training data set or not. So this is the membership. So for the data reconstruction attack, which is, for example, we replace this image with some random noise. So the attacker don't have anything about uh, the original data, but it can try to reconstruct the original input of based on the gradient of the or the model. So property inference attack is an, another kind of inference attack in addition to the membership. So for example, if it has the, it don't, it doesn't have anything but it can infer whether the data, for example, in terms of this image is cute or is yellow fur or something. So it's one property of this original input. So this is a 
it's several different kind of uh, privacy related attacks. So this is also in our threat model, which we want to propose something to defense against those attacks. So in our case, I know there are many other defense mechanisms such as a homophobic encryption, differential privacy. But in our case, we want to use the system perspective protection, which is trusted execution environments. So what is TE for short? So what is TE? So TE actually has already been used for several times in our uh, in the current uh, research uh, field. For example, most of them are centralized deep learning with TE. For example, there are several names you may have been seeing during the research work. Uh, but most of them are using Intel SGX because use Intel SGX is a desk based, desktop based uh, TE. It's more flexible to, to use it. And another one is ARM Trusto, so which is mostly on mobile IoT devices. And another thing I want to mention is that using TE, because TE is very small, for example, they have very limited computational resources. It's 128 megabytes for SGX and uh, 16 megabytes for Truststone. So they are very small. I mean, if, in terms of the secure memory. So most of them, the current uh, research are doing inference because training is really hard because training will cost much more memory. So the DE is very small, but it's still fast because you really it's just uh, turn the work that it runs. So it doesn't cost too much cost compared to like a, uh, cartographic encryption. And also I want to mention that you may see trusted applications or enclave. So there are different name of the, of the, of the TE. So en enclave is mostly used with, uh, SGX and up trust the application is mostly used, uh, I'm trusting. So Later we will use TA, which is a for short for of the, the trust application. So the question is how to conduct machine learning with such a small TE. So basically, first of all, we want to mention machine learning. So federated learning is one subset of it. So if we can do some machine learning based, maybe we can, we can have found a way to do federated learning. So I still want to going deeper into the trusted execution environments. So what it is, so basically, if we have some device, which is an untrusted device. So for example, if this is a cloud, a user may always don't trust the cloud. So which is the untrusted host. The untrusted host have a sub part, a isolated area inside the, de uh, the cloud device which is a isolation, also a TE. So there are many techniques that achieve this. For example, ARM Trusto, Intel SGX, AWS, Nontra Enclave, also the new version of, in addition to Trusto from ARM, ARM CCA. So there are several techniques that people have proposed. So for example, there are some data provider and also some program provider, for example, in our case, pro program provider can be the, uh, the deep, deep learning or machine learning algorithm. And the data provider can be the data itself or uh, the model, model portraying model or something like this. And the re receiver can be, so there are, those things can be the same, same uh, perspective, same person example, because the receiver can be the data provider. So another thing, very another very important thing is the attestation server. So because those separate participants need to first build a channel or build a trusted between them. So they need a third party, which is usually, for example, for the SGX, it's Intel, which is the third party to provide the trust between them to build the trust. So this is the attestation server. So a data provider or program provider 
want to attend, uh, say, ensure that the TE is not uh, branched. So they have different attestation server. And by using the server, they can build a re remote attestation and then have the TLS, TLS secure channels. So after the channel is built, they can transfer the information they want. And in the channel between the between the user and the DE, so the trust, the untrusted host and the people who control it don't have the ability to touch the things inside the DE. Okay, so with that knowledge, we have this uh, framework design, which is, uh, this is for machine learning for the first case. So if you look at uh, this figure, they have two separate uh, stages. The first one is model preparation. And the second one is model parti part partitioned execution. So the two separate things is that you first prepare, uh, prepare the mod model inside the device and then you execute uh, training or inference inside between the two things. So, I mean, between the RE and TE, RE is a rich execution environment. The TE is a trusted execution environment. Let me, so here, the threat model is that the model provider, which is a, for, so in this case, we can imagine that uh, this is a, there is a cloud that want to deploy a device, uh, deploy a model on a device, but he or she don't trust the, the user's device. So the model provider only trusts the TE. So we protect the model inside the TE. More specifically, the first step, the model preparation, will include you first uh, the CA, which is a client application, which is the application part in the RE, which is a noble application uh, in the operating system. And the TA is another side of the CA. So this is the application that's run in the TE. So the CA requests some, request the model to be loaded into the CA. And then it also invoke the TA, which because the CA is responsible to invoke another trusted application inside the TE. And after it load the, layers so after the revoke it can load the layers some non-sensitive layers will be loaded into the ca some sensitive layers will be loaded into the ta so those layers will be put inside different part of the memory which one of them is non-secure memory and the, the ta part is in the secure memory and there will be a key which is a te key used to secure storage will be used to decrypt the layers inside the TA. So this key should be from the, the CA, but the CA doesn't know the, the, the key because this key is also used to encrypt the layers. So after we have the layers inside different part of the memory, we can do the model partition execution. So Inference is quite easy, quite easy, right? Because you can just feed the input to the, the, the image you want to do some prediction and you feed it into the first layer of the model and it transfer, the activation transform from it, from the CA to the TA and you then forward it throughout the last rest of the layer and then you get the results. So in our case, we do some normalization because we know that the last layer of the model still can predict something and it will still leak some information about the prediction of the... So after this, we get output and we transform it to the REE. So we, after that, we finish the inference. So for the for the training, we if we want to still train the model, we can do it uh, between it. So 
this will introduce more steps because after you do the forward pass, you still need to get the backward pass. So for the forward pass is activation, which pass from the RE to the TE through secure memory. Uh, so, so shared memory, but in backward pass, you get the arrows, the backpack arrows from the TE to RE. So af after you update the layers that you want, you can save the memory, but still the T part need to be saved, use the T the T key, cryptograph key. So the results we show here is sorry, sorry Vincent, there is a one question that appeared okay. in the chat. So I'll try to unmute our Sonny. Yeah, hi. Uh, the question is simple. So, uh, if I want to use a GPU for uh, for my ML execution, can I still use uh, this inside T, or is something uh, only exclusive on CPUs? Yeah, this is a great question. So, actually, TE for now. So, the commercial TE is mostly in, um, not mostly, the, most of them are within the CPU. So, TE is a technique used in CPU. So, in our case, in those work that we already down here is in CPU. So there are also some GPU TE pro, uh, proposed by some recent work. I can, I will uh, introduce them later in the related, in the future work. That's good, I will present some of them later, okay. Yeah, okay. thank you. So the result we have is if we hide some of the layers. So in this case, we hide the last layer because for membership inference attack, here we will use the uh, stand of the art white box MAA membership inference attack. We hide the last several layers inside TE. So as you can see in this figure, the, the first bar is when we output all the classes with scores. So the original prediction result. For the rest of the third three one, which is the first top one with scores, top five with ranks, our classes with ranks. So when you do the normalization, the membership inference attack becomes really hard to do this. So it's around 50%, which is a uh, random guessing. So similarly, as you can see in this figure, this uh, is the layers of one Rosnite in Trustle. So when you hide one layers in the Trustle, the precision will drop a lot into the random guessing. So this is one type of privacy that we aim to protect. The question is, how about the other privacy related attacks some, such as uh, data reconstruction or uh, property inference. So and until here, this is the part that we defense against membership inference attack. If you have any questions, you can jump up here. Yeah, maybe I have one quick question just to understand here. So, so you, you have been using TEE to kind of hide the last layer. This is just inference or this is also kind of throughout training or? Uh, this also includes training. So basically, uh, when we implement the, the framework, it includes both training and the inference. Because, because for training, when people usually do not do this because training costs much more memory. But in our case, we train the layer. We put the layers inside T. So basically, if the memory is too small or the model is too huge, we can put the last layer inside the Mm -hmm. okay, so, okay. so it's more tweenable. Okay, so in this case, it's only the computation related to the last layer, which is inside and then gets de de decrypted. So any participant only observes, let's say the input to this layer and then some post-processing of the output, like a top one score or whatever. Yeah, whatever yeah, yeah. I see, I see. And, and the fact, this is probably a naive question, uh, but the, the fact that, uh, let's say whoever is owning the TE cannot decrypt maybe at an earlier stage, this is because there is some kind of code attestation. So, so 
the code has been agreed with all the participants ahead of time, and it's impossible for the the owner of the TV to modify the code that is actually being run. This is what ensures that there is no unintended decrypting, you know, of like intermediary steps. Is this correct or? Yeah, yeah. This is a also a good question actually. So good comments. So basically, if you have a we have a TE running here, so we need to make sure first the TE is correct, so the integrity of the TE is is good. So if the TE is branched, we don't need we can't do anything more because so in this threat model, the the trust boundary is shaped from first. Uh, if we don't have TE, the trust boundary is we can't trust it, the host itself. So there is nothing we can do. But with DE, with some attestation techniques provided here, we can say, okay, if those are the integrity of those things are good, we can trust the DE. So this is also a mutual mutual technique that already been used several in several places because if we are using fingerprinting on the matter is iPhone or Android, they use the DE inside the device. So uh, the, the difference between those two is that uh, in our case, because this is a, like the, the TE can be, we can develop some application to use the TE, but in those cases, because like the fingerprints thing, they have the, it's not easy to use TE because a third party cannot use it. Only the device manufacturer can use it. So, the, but the TE is, become, is becoming more and more, uh, accessible and there are more space that has been provided by the manufacturer to the other parties to use the TE. I see, I see. So, so, so maybe just to also maybe ask something more, more, more precisely. So, so on top of kind of trusting the TE, there is also some agreement needed ahead of time of about which code will run, right? Because of course, otherwise, yeah. If, People can modify the code that is run, or even though it's run inside, you know, I can, I can, okay, decrypt earlier than what is supposed to be done, and, and so on, right? So, so this assumes there has been also some kind of code attestation, or and then that, that you can enforce, right, through the TE, make sure that the code that was run was indeed the one that everybody agreed yeah. on, right? So, so this is yeah, yeah, happening yeah. under the hood here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So before, actually, before the training or inference inside TE, there are many things to do before this. So as you said, for the code, for the program providers, actually usually there are a, like a policy between different uh, participants. They need to uh, examine the policy, they are correct. So for example, for the program, they need, uh, they can do a hash sum. So, so they need to make sure that, that the hash sum is the, is the correct for the program. If the hash sum is, different from the from that one in the policy, then the DE or the provider can, the data provider can uh, refuse to transfer the data from itself to the TE. Yeah. Okay, thanks, thanks. Like I said, those were, yeah. uh, okay. I don't know much about TE, so, so these are kind of nice questions. questions. Thanks for the clarifications. Okay, so, so the next step of this is that uh, we have mentioned membership inference attack. So how about the others? The data reconstruction and the property inference. So those, because for membership, we know that the last layer is most sensitive. In our research, we found that, and in our in others' research also, they they have the same results. The last layer or the prediction score is very important for the membership inference attack. But how about the others? So we have done some work uh, to measure if for the other attacks. What's the layers? How about the difference? So we, we use some information theory things to matter, but uh, for simplicity, if you can imagine that we, we just use the attack itself to do the matter. So basically if we have a model like Linux, we, so here is two layer, but uh, you can imagine we, we have for each layer, we use the attack itself to, to attack on the gradients of this layer. So. In fact, we're learning, we train the model and then we get the gradient of the model of one snapshot and then we do the attack on the gradients for, if for every layer. So as you can see, when we do this attack, so for data reconstruction, it's more easier to use the first layers. 
and along with the layers going up, going downstream, it's become very hard to do the data reconstruction. This also is reasonable because the first layer is more, it's much near to the input. So for the property inference attack, what we found is that uh, somewhere in the middle, which is more easier. So for membership is the last, but for the property inference, so membership is more related to the uh, task, to the main task, to the prediction task. But for property inference, it's not that related one uh, to the last, to the task, but sometimes it's related. And also it's a high level information. It's not the same like uh, the data reconstruction, which is uh, original information. So in this case, what we found is that it's more like in the middle somewhere. So here, if you look at it, there is a dashed vertical line. So this is uh, so as the, the first several layers, the first and the second is a convolutional layer. And the rest of them uh, is the fully connected layer. So as you can see, it always exists somewhere like after the connection between the, uh, the feature extractor and the classifier. So the results is that the highest for the data, recon data reconstruction may be the first layers and for the property inference is the classifier. So this is a empirical results. So basically if you look at there, there are many points which is a different uh, data set and the different uh, property we measured and we then do the reg regression because that was uh, kind of separate, but the overall trade is that it's look like this. So we can see that this is very different compared uh, to the membership inference, the, the information location among, uh, among the model. So what we learn from here is that federal learning requires the protection of all layers, not like the model uh, uh, on device, the model develop deployment, because deployment, you only need to put the model on device. You don't need to transform the data to add the model to other participants. But in federal learning, you need to transfer the model itself to all the others and also the cloud. So it's really hard if we don't protect all the layers. So this is not the case for membership inference attack. So what we could do for this It, in this proposed framework, what we use is the greedy layer-wise learning. So this is the idea that in, in order to learn a machine learning model, we don't train it from the beginning to the end, which is the end-to-end -end training. So what we train is that for a target architecture, we train the model layer by layer, first from the first layer. And after it converge or something, we move to the next layer. So in this case, what we do is that we train it after converges and then we move to the next layer. So the benefits of this is that when you finish one layer inside TE, for example, we don't need to touch it anymore. So the linkage in, in in terms of federated learning, it's also related to the, the how many snapshots that you leak. For example, if you only leak uh, 10 snapshots, uh, the whole training process, then the adversary have least information about the model. But, but if federated learning only train once, which is not, your, not the case, but if we train the model only once and leak the model only once, so it's really hard to attack it in terms of the specific information like data reconstruction, because the aggregation is much larger because uh, you have more epochs, you have more uh, bunch size to aggregate together. The privacy is kind of aggregate together. So specific information is already loose. So what we do here is the, uh, it's a chain layer one by one. So the, so that model we have here is that any participate in this uh, 
by the learning paradigm only trust others TE. So in such a case, we don't need to the participate to trust the other. They will uh, attest their TE, so they trust the others TE only. So there will be some, I know there will be, there will be some questions about this. So do, can you believe any, anyone have a TE that can be used? So this is in our assumption. And uh, we think along with the, along with the time going on. So there are many T already being used for each device. So that's the, this is a good thing. And we have this assumption here. And let's go into the detail about this. So first uh, for the framework, how it works, we have uh, two phase, phases here. The first is configuration. And the second is report, reporting. Okay, so for the first, first usually if I do learning, we do some device selection and and in our case, we also need a secure channel between different devices. And as you can see, there is a server and there, there are several cl clients. So for each, this is one of them. We know that uh, usually clients, because we are training the layer, so training the model layer by layer. So we, we, we want to have some public knowledge if we can, tr can transform from the server to the client, then that will be good because we can train this layer. So in this case, we have public knowledge. If we can transform it, then this will be good, the first step. And the second step is that we do some model initialization. So as you can see, we initialize one layer along with its classifier inside TE. And then we transfer the this layer to all the participants, so the TE, to do some further things, it, which is the first step of the reporting phase. We train the one layer inside this TE. We do the, this is a forward pass, the blue line, and then backward, backward to update this layer only. And then the client can report the fine-tuned layer of this submodel and then transform back to the server's TE. So and then after this, the TE after get many uh, client's T uh, layers, it can do the aggregation. Then so this is one step of this uh, whole process. So we want to update this layer. Uh, after it converges, it then we move to the next layer. So this is very important because you can also move after training, we can also move from one, two, three to the end. And then at the last several steps, we do this again. But in our prototype, in our framework de design, we want to train the layer. After it's finished, we then move to the next layer. So this is a gradient layer-wise training. Uh, any questions here? Uh, maybe I have one also, I got cut also for a few seconds. So maybe I missed, I missed this to, just to confirm like uh, in between, so once you are finished training one layer, is this, this trained uh, layer now needs to be decrypted and shared with everybody or? Yeah, yeah. So. Because uh, if one layer goes out of the TE, it must be encrypted. So, yeah, every time it's going to uh, goes to the TE, it will be decrypted, and every time it goes out, it will be encrypted. Okay, so the the observations of the participants will be kind of uh, each like a sequence of trained layer. Essentially, that's that's what the the, the yeah, participants yeah. will actually observe. Okay. Yeah, yeah, the, uh, the aggregate version of this layer and okay. it's in encrypted. Right. Going to the T, right. Okay. okay. So that's the framework, how we designed. Uh, so the next step, we want to measure the performance of this because as you can see, if we train layer, train the model layer by layer, it may introduce new overhead. 
So in the evaluation, what we do is that uh, we use a, first the hardware is NERC, which is a small device. We just want to use it to aggregate the model. So it's in, into SGX, which is the server side. And the uh, Hackybird, as you can see here, the Hackybird, which, which is uh, ARM Trustom. So it's usually be used for mobile device TE development. And uh, for the software side, for the Intel SGX, we use the Microsoft Open Enclave. And for the uh, client side, we use OpenDE, which is uh, the Dark Knight I just uh, mentioned in previous several slides. So we also have some scrap to control it, uh, like uh, the communication, how, how, how they aggregate layers. So it's automatic works here. So we just, then we measure the performance of this uh, implementation. And uh, for, we also measure, as you can see, several models in that AlexNet data set. We focus on MIST and Cifferton, and we also separate the IID and non-IID. For the metric we use in terms of the model privacy, as I mentioned, I we will focus on three uh, categories, uh, data reconstruction attack, property inference attack, membership inference attack. So how we marry it, we just uh, use the attack that we found at that moment, the most uh, popular, most uh, the, the best one uh, we can find and to attack on, on our uh, implementation. And the learning process, uh, performance we measure is first the test accuracy of the model after training and the communi communication roles and the, communi uh, the amount of communication. So the, the, reason, of, uh, the reason for why we, we separate the two things is that uh, because in each communication role, the amount of communication is kind of maybe different because we train the layer separately. For each layer, the amount of communication can be different. So we measure the two uh, factors separately. And for the system cost, we only measure the client side. We mainly must measure this side. We also have some results about the server side, but this is most important because in fact, we're learning what is really participate in the training is the client side. So we measure is uh, CPU execution time, the memory usage of the device, and also the energy consumption of it. So for the model privacy, what I want to mention is that as I present, uh, we hide layers inside TE. So the privacy is kind of, uh, is by design to, to prevent here. So as you can see in this uh, table, so the this, uh, this line is a uh, end to end end to end, which is a normal training of the faculty learning. You train the model altogether. The PPFL is the pri privacy preserving faculty learning that we proposed, which is uh, you train the model layer by layer. So because in this case, we also hide the layers inside TE. So for data reconstruction attack, it cannot do anything because the gradients is inside TE. So in our threat model, it cannot access the gradient. So the reconstruction results is kind of uh, it's a white noise uh, image. And for the pro property inference attack, it's around it's still around the random guessing, which is a 0 0.5. And also for the MIA, because it can st still access, after the model has been trained, it can access uh, the model in some way, only the black box. But uh, if we put the last layer always inside TE, there is no things to leak, just as uh, dark, uh, dark nights that I mentioned. So you, you can still hide the, the layer and the prediction results in some way. Uh, for the communication cost, as we can see, so for here, I list three models. 
we used. The baseline accuracy is that uh, after we train several uh, epoch, epochs, so this is the baseline accuracy that we get for the end-to-end, -end, so for the normal fabric learning. So we can see that uh, we can, to reach the same baseline accuracy, we can even get, uh, we can use least communication roles in some cases, and also least communication among in some cases. And so here, if we separate the training phase, so for the end-to-end, -end, so this is the broadcast training, upload the model and aggregation, and the, this is the total of the time that used. So for end-to-end, -end, it's around 2,700 uh, to, for, for the PPFL is like uh, almost three times, uh, two or three times of it. So this is because we, you can imagine that because we train the layer, layer by layer to train the model. So it should increase the overall time. So as you can see, if we train the layer separately, it will increase the time, right? So this is for communication and for the learning. learning... Sorry, Vincent, there okay, we have a ahead. question from audience. I'll try to unmute or Shani. Yeah, uh, the question is about uh, the communication cost, uh, the table on the left. So if I understand correctly, you say that with, with your system, you need less communication rounds than the vanilla one with the end to end, right? So um, yeah. if this is the case, I don't understand why, why this happens. Uh, so in our case, I think the reason is that uh, if you look at the baseline accuracy, the AlexNet is not that high. Right, so usually if, uh, if, if you are aiming at a high accuracy uh, of the training, so for Alex Knight, if it's, uh, this is CIFR 10, I think. So this is CIFR 10 for, it can maybe can reach uh, 80%. But in our case is around, uh, it's not even up to 70%. So I think the reason is that, uh, we, we need to tune the parameters more. We need to, so in our case, we don't aim at the highest uh, accuracy. So they are, so we fi fi uh, fix the, the learning par uh, hyperparameters and then we train the, finish the training. So in such a case, it could have least communication roles. I, is this answer your question? Uh... Not really. I I don't get why. I mean, if you if you fix the hyperparameters, if you fix the model, if you fix the, the data, um, and then you run the vanilla federated learning and you run your system, why your system takes less communication around to reach the same accuracy? Because it's risk, uh, it to reach the baseline accuracy faster. Uh, so if you look at the the figure here, so this could answer your question, answer you. So basically, if you look at this figure, uh, the Alex on CIFAR10, mm -hmm. uh, as you can see, if the two line, there is a contraction between them. So the blue line is end-to-end, -end, IID, and the darker or original uh, orange one is uh, like a PPFL IID. So they are trained on the same setting. So the PPFL can over, can reach, outperform the end to end in this point. Uh, yes, I see. Okay, so yeah, okay. This is also part of the results I want to I want to show. So our framework PPFL can reset reset the accuracy for every new layer. So this is uh, also as you can imagine because if we add a new layer, the layer need to be retrained from the beginning. So after you finish several uh, epochs of the layer one training, if you add a new layer on top of it it will drop the accuracy a lot and then you'll train the, this new layer 
but the increase is very fast. And another thing is with more layer, we have higher accuracy. And in some cases, that's what I just uh, mentioned. So it will output outperform end-to-end -end training in some cases. But uh, actually, yeah, there is a question here. So if we train the model in a more uh, sophisticated way, like uh, for each uh, setting, we use different uh, training strategy. Maybe the reason, uh, maybe the results will changed. Yeah. Okay, so for the client side system performance, we can see the overhead is not that bad. It's small, and for CPU, it's around 15. For memory usage, it's 18%. Uh, for energy consumption, it's 21%. And also, it have comparable results with uh, end to end journey. So, another thing I want to mention is that maybe we can train two layers together, right? Because uh, in the previous case, we train la layer, each layer separately. Uh, but if the memory space is bigger enough, we can also train two layers, right? So what we found is that if we train the layer, two layer together, this can further reduce the communication roles and also the communication amount. So this is also still depends on the setting, but in our case, we found uh, if we tune the layers that we uh, selected, for example, if we can choose one or two layers, so maybe we can have better performance compared to if you train the whole model together. And also the test accuracy is good. We reach comparable accuracy, and in some cases, for example, for a complex model, we this train two layers can perform better compared to train one layer. And uh, this is also happens for the system performance. Uh, we don't see huge increase of the overhead, and also because you uh, combine several layers as one, you compare two layers as one. So, for example, this can replace the cost of expensive layers with cheaper layers and you can get a similar uh, client-side system overhead. So this is uh, the result that we have and under the con contribution, uh, I mentioned that uh, we aim at a privacy-related attack <clears throat> and that's the most, uh, most uh, critical privacy-related attacks. And also we have comparable machine learning ut utility with sometimes even least communication roles, codes. <clears throat> but as I said, this could depend on the case. So uh, it could be interesting if we can further measure others' uh, settings. And for the system cost, uh, it's a, a small overhead, it's around 20%. And uh, another thing that we don't measure too much, but it's very interesting that maybe we can do some layer-wise training. For example, because we have a multi-layer block, this may be more suitable for heterogeneous environments. For example, in some cases, some clients after it trains several first layers, it can uh, exit the whole training process. So in such case, we have more tunable things to do for the factory learning. Vincent, uh, this might be a right place to stop uh, and, and, and conclude. Uh, we have a number of slides of future work, but we will share the slides uh, with Samuel and Aurelian to put it on the website anyway, because we are at the top of the hour. Yeah, yeah, that could be the last page yes. I, I could mention. So, yeah. Any yeah, questions? Thanks a lot for the, the nice talk. Indeed, we have some time for, for questions, and I guess this might be the opportunity also to mention some of these uh, future work lines uh, that you are mentioning on the slides. So do we have any additional questions from the audience? OK, so while maybe people think about questions, so, so maybe a, maybe a gen, general one. So, so you mentioned, of course, uh, OK, there are other privacy preserving techniques right out there that, that can be used. So you mentioned DP, MPC, and, and so on. So, so 
in your opinion, is there some, some so, so of course this comes with different threat models and different costs, you know, different trade-offs. And so in your opinion, is there value to, to try to combine also TEEs with some of these other techniques? And, and if so, what, what do you think we could maybe hope to, to get by, by trying to combine these uh, frameworks together? Yeah, that's a great question. So actually we have some uh, experiments about this. So for example, if we use TE to <clears throat> hide several layers, but we add noise to the other layers. So this is one type of uh, application that uh, may help because for example, if you mentioned different privacy, if we add noise to the uh, last layer, for example, in this case, we can defense against uh, several attacks because you add noise to the output. But the, in the threat model, you don't consider a device on the device, right? Because if there is an adversary on the device, it can, uh, observe the noise that you ate. Uh, so if we want to give it a stronger trusted model, so we can put the like a noise addition inside the TE. So this can make it stronger, I think. This is a uh, one case. So for the others, hemomorphic encryption, I, I actually don't have any thought on that. Uh, thanks. Thanks for the answer. Do we have more questions? I think Hamed has had to, to leave apparently. Uh, I can't open the... Yeah, he said he had to drop now for a call, which can be late for, so... So do okay. I, did I answer the GPU question? I, I, I thought. No, that's true. You, you, you said you would, you would maybe say a few additional things about GPUs. Maybe this is a good opportunity to do so now. Yeah, yeah. So, <clears throat> so actually this is a very pr promising and interesting direction if we can put a GPU plus with the TE. So this is one, one work here. So, which is a uh, recent year, this year. Uh, last year, so new year. Uh, so this is a, uh, they put the GPU with the TE and output some layer, uh, layer like a mat metric multiplication to the GPU. And this will increase, in include some cryptographic encryption because when you output the things outside the TE, you need to make sure first the, the privacy, the confidentiality and also the integrity of the data. So that could be one way. So another way that could be promising is the, if you include the TE, uh, the GPU inside the TE, so which is the GPU TE. So you add uh, the driver and the runtime that need to be used for, the, for you to build the TE and do some attestation on it. So they also research, uh, if, for example, which one? Uh, this Graviton. Um, they, they are doing these things. I, I will show, share the later, if you share the slides if you want to check it out later. Uh, but the things that is that uh, when you include too much things into the TE, it will have the up, update uh, influences because it will increase the TCB, uh, the trust, trusting base, uh, trust, sorry, the trust uh, compute base. So this will be a not good option for a good DE, but uh, I think this will can be a trade-off between the two things if we want to use machine learning inside DE because machine learning is a very heaviest computation. It not, has to be some trade-off between the trust and the, and the performance here. This is for the DE for the GPU side. Okay. All right, thanks a lot. Uh, I don't Thank think you. there are any more questions. Uh, just uh, someone commenting on this chat that Slalom is proposed by Florian Trimer and Dan Money. Uh, uh, 
I'm not sure what is slalom, but uh, I think it's something you mentioned somewhere in your slides, at least at some point. Okay, or maybe this was uh, meant to be a private message to someone. So, uh, never mind. I think we can thank you again for the nice talk. Uh, thank you. Thanks again. And uh, yeah, make sure if you don't mind sending the slides to, to Samuel, that would be great. So we can put everything okay. both the, the, the video recording and the, the slides on uh, online for people to, to do later. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. All right. Thanks a lot. Thank you, everyone. See you. Thank you, Vince. Thank you, everybody. See you. Bye.